Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the club and guests. It is August the 7th, 2023, and this is a regular online meeting of the West Shore Photography Club. I'm Dennis Baker, your president and host for this evening and presenter. Yeah, Joe's going to present too. So welcome, everybody. Glad to have you on board. Uh, just a couple quick notes, and then we'll get started. This, believe it or not, is the last meeting of the club year because our club year runs from September through the end of August. So last meeting, our next meeting will be on the September the 11th to kick off the new year. And Joe's gonna tell you about the, our presenter that night we're very pleased about. Uh, it also means that it's that time of the year that, that I plead for you to get online or, or send a rich a check to pay your dues. We currently have a record number of members, 145. Oh my God! That, that's more people than we've ever had uh, as members of the club. I'm very, very happy about that, and I hope you are too. Uh, and I'd like that to continue, if not increase. So uh, please send Rich a check, or if you are, are uh, uh, you know able and, and willing to do it online, PayPal is very slick. Most of our members do use PayPal, so that's up to you. Uh, I'll put Rich's address in the follow-up email that goes out tomorrow morning, uh, along with the link to the recording, of course, and uh, a copy of my handout from tonight. So time to pay your dues. Still $25. What a bargain. What a bargain. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. He's going to tell you about September the 11th meeting and about trips. So Joe, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, January, the, excuse me, September the 11th, we do have Ian Plant speaking, and he's known worldwide as basically a landscape photographer and travels to some very exotic places. But he also is very practical and down to earth, known most people don't can't travel to where he goes. And uh, so he's going to be he's going to be presenting to us. He's really, really good at wide angle lenses, too, which is probably one of the most difficult lenses to use. But he has that down. And um, I've been on some workshops with him where he's taught me how to use a wide angle lens. And uh, and he's going to do that with us also. So that'll be on September the 11th, our kickoff meeting. So and um, some trips. We had a trip on Saturday. And uh, Mark, are you here? Yes, you yes, are. Yes, I am. Yeah, can you give us an update on that, on that session we had? Sure, sure. We had a we we had a um, a presentation basically. Uh, I shouldn't quite say it a presentation, but so much of an active workshop type of thing uh, on studio lighting at um, Fine Arts Photography, and it was hosted by Gary Knob. Did I have his last name right? Uh, Gary Knob. Yeah. Knob. Okay. I don't know if it's German or Dutch. The Dutch use the oh, okay. <laughs> Um, And he did he, the, the, the subject was studio lighting, and he discussed the modern strobes versus the traditional studio strobes and how the new ones are battery powered and have radios and all this kind of stuff built in. Uh, talked about diffusers of when to use umbrellas, when to use soft boxes. And then he did. Then he did a demo of the different types of portraiture lighting. Um, they he did um, some Rembrandt lighting, modified Rembrandt lighting that he tends to like a little better, and then Paramount or butterfly lighting. And um, he showed that uh, he also showed that tethering software doesn't always work the way you expect it to. He has some hiccups. Um, it was very it was very informative from both an equipment standpoint and from understanding lighting standpoint so i really enjoyed it and a couple of interesting notes that that he uh he mentioned is that uh, right now um his shop is the only place in the area that processes film and um over the life of the company they've done about three and a half million rolls of film <laughs> which was you know that's astounding and the other thing is that uh, the prints that he does um up to about a size 12 by 18 inch he uses uh, the old uh, wet chemistry process. They're pro they're a silver halide uh, print, and when they get larger than that, then he then he has to switch over to inkjet printing. So if you're interested in seeing what some of your pictures look like on silver halide, you might want to talk to him. That's it, Joe. Thank you, Mark. We had 14 people there, by the way. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say that, didn't I? He also, um, you can't. Can you read that? Yeah, twenty percent off. Twenty percent off. Is it backwards? Nope. No. Nope? Okay. 
20% um, off coupons for any prints other than some of the metal prints that he does. Uh, and he has a super secret code. And the super secret code is West Shore CC, West Shore Camera Club, West Shore CC. If you go online to Fine Arts location you and you want to order a print, he gives you 20% off. Yeah, really nice guy, too. And someone's saying that they do not hear us. Can you guys all hear me? I can hear yes. you fine. Yes. Okay. Um, yep. So I don't know how we can resolve that. But so that's that was on uh, uh, Saturday. This coming Wednesday evening, we have a night workshop and one that we're really looking forward to that. Uh, last year, Jurgen LeBaire uh, took us on a night uh a session in Harrisburg, and uh, we're going to try and replicate that to some extent without cringing on all of his super secret stuff. And uh, so that's going to be around 745 we meet. And uh, on the email that you have, you'll have the notice, you'll have the things that you should know how to use in the dark, like changing ISO, um, shutter speeds and f stops and things like that. So that'll, and it'll be for about maybe an, an hour and 45 minutes or so. And where we're going to go is very safe as according to the, uh, the Harrisburg Police Department. So we're going to be okay that way. And then on Saturday the 19th, we have a photo walk with Mary Fox and Eve Smith. Mary, you want to just give us a brief on that one, please? Um, and Harrisburg is going to, we're going to be on State Street, start on State Street at Kunkel Plaza, which is where Mr. Kunkel sits on the bench. And we'll be going to a one block east and west, I think it's east and west. And we'll be going from State Street, I'm, I'm sorry, from Front Street to Third Street. So there's going to be a lot of like businesses, houses, alleys, a lot of alleys. And it should be kind of interesting. Then one thing I want to point out is we, we have to pay for parking. On the street, you can there's a parking garage, but I don't know if it's any cheaper and it's certainly not any closer. So you'll have to pay for parking. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mary. And um, at the end of this month of August, maybe the first or so of September, we're going to have a field trip for sunflowers to uh, Lesher Farms, and you'll get notice of that as it comes up. And then we have a Frederick Frederick photo walk on September the 9th. Dennis, you want to tell us about that? Uh, yes, yes. <clears throat> this was originally uh, scheduled last spring, and we ran into some bad weather, but uh, Cam Miller is the uh, president of the Frederick uh, Camera Click, and she has done walks for her group previously. She has this super organized, divided into groups. Some members from her club are going to assist in leading the groups. We uh, hope to get everybody together for lunch at some point, and the email that goes out uh, specifies where to park, and uh, should should be a wonderful morning in uh, Frederick. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Right. On uh, September the 9th, Saturday, September 9th. Hey, Dennis. Yes. Don Uvick, uh, just to let you know, ironically, I was in Frederick, and, and on that date, there's something they're going to be celebrating called Frederick in the Streets Festival, the same day. Ooh, that should be so, good. Yeah. Even more yeah, to photograph. I, yeah, yeah. I happened to get a card when I was down there, um, uh, recently, and it's, it is a fantastic place to go. But I happen to see and read on my calendar Frederick in the Streets Festival. So yeah, it should make it even doubly better on the ninth. Yeah, we that's all. Get there, get there early. <laughs> hey, thanks, Don. And um, we have some other trips coming up: uh, Lake Tobias Wildlife Park, which is a really, really cool place to go to. Um, we're going to go to the Bower, uh, Mill Creek Falls, Mechanicsburg Photo Walk, Hershey Zoo. All those trips are coming up here in a short period of time. So, Mr. Baker, that is it. Okay, thank you, Joe. Let's see about sharing my screen here and we'll get things up and running. Joe, what do you see? I see you with your fancy uh, display up there. Uh, adding depth and richness? Yeah, absolutely, yep. Okay, let's see if we can go full screen with that. How's that look? Uh, no. You need nope. to go for the screen. No. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see it now? I can see it, but it's not full screen. Come down yeah. there to the bottom 
Yeah, um, I, I, I went to full screen and it showed up. Uh, let me try that one more time. Hmm. No. I don't know. I don't know why that's not working. Okay, my apologies, Dennis. That's, that's, that's fine, Dennis. That right there is mm -hmm. fine. We can see no. it real well. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's do if, if you go if you go lower right, there's a presentation mode. Um, if you go down to lower right, it's that thing next to the slider. That one. There yeah. Yeah. Slideshow. Which one, Don? That one. That, that one right there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's that's the one I hit before. Yeah. But, uh, oh, okay. All right, that yeah. usually does the trick. Sorry. Tennis, you have two form. monitors going. Yes. Ah, uh, switch monitor. It, it's 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 showing the. Uh, it's showing you the monitor that the uh, presenter I, uses. I don't know how to get it over to the other monitor. Dennis, that's I, okay. When you just I can't remember. Just go to the other one. You're fine. We, we can see it fine. That's perfect. Okay, good enough. Good enough. As many of you know, uh, I spent 18 days in Europe. About, I came home about three weeks ago. Came back with like 18,000 images. Okay. Uh, and I have gone through all of those, called them, deleted the ones that I don't want to keep, uh, and then picked out about 100 to 150 almost every day to post on my website to share with the other folks who went on the trip. As I went through these images, I wanted to, at least the, the ones I was picked to, to edit, the ones I was going to put on the website, I wanted them to look as good as possible. Of course, I shot in raw file format, and I worked with them in Lightroom and sometimes in Photoshop. I uh, didn't want to spend a whole lot of time because I had a lot of images to go through. But as I worked my way through the images, uh, I just felt very good uh, about Lightroom and Photoshop and especially about the masking panel uh, in Lightroom. I thought I was able to add some depth and richness to those image, images that just didn't exist with the regular processing. Uh, so I thought it would be helpful to share that with you. And even for the folks who do not use Lightroom, these digital dodge and burn techniques can be applied via any uh, software photo editing program that you have. Uh, it's just that the new masking panel with Lightroom Classic makes it even easier and more precise. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a look here at some of my slides on the show. Uh, we generally consider adjustments to your make, that you make to your photos in two categories. Global adjustments means that when you move the slider, you're affecting the image as a whole, okay? It's the basic processing. And I'm, I'm not gonna spend time on basic processing tonight if you're not familiar with setting the white balance and setting a black point and a white point and, and what I consider to be those basic global adjustments then you, know, you should do a little research and, and watch a few videos about that. This presentation is taking it a step beyond that. After you do your basic global processing, then how do you really add some pizzazz to your images? Well, you do that, you can do that one way, is by using localized adjustments. And there are changes that you make to just a specific area on your photograph. For instance, if you have a, a picture of a person and their face is dark, well, that, that's not very impressive. So you might want to brighten the face without adjusting the rest of the picture. So we're going to show you how to do that. And you do it with a localized adjustment in Lightroom using or in any program you have. And typically what you would do over the in previous times, you would simply use a brush and brush over the face and then move the slider up to just affect that area where you brushed. And of course, with a brush, then you have the decision to make, am I going to try to be really precise and just get around the edges? Or am I just going to kind of smudge it and, and feather it and hope that people can't tell? Well, with the new masking tools, you can do that much more precisely. And, and it, Lightroom Classic does an excellent job with most selections. What it does then, it adds contrast and make sure subjects stand out. Uh, so we're gonna show you uh, a couple of examples and then uh, actually do some processing uh, to show you how this works. Uh, so contrast is the key. And the contrast differentiates items within your scene. 
The contrast can be due to a brightness difference, a color, a U, a color saturation, you know, the intensity of the color, uh, the luminance, the brightness of the color, or the sharpness. You know, a lot of times we blur the background and the, have the subject sharp, and that gives the impression that the subject is, is closer to you and it stands out from the background. So that's the, the whole deal here is to try, when you present your photos, to make the subject readily uh, uh, visible, you know, that, that the person recognizes your subject and it makes it stand out from the background. So since the beginning of digital photography, we've been doing this digital dodging and burning, which is analogous to what they've done, uh, photographers did in the old days in the, in the dark room, but we do it uh, on our computers now. And in the past, we've done it with uh, a brush, a linear gradient, and a radial gradient, you know, in Lightroom. They were the tools that were primarily used up until about a year ago. Uh, and they're the, these tools are available in any, as I say, any photo uh, editing program that you might use. More recently, they added a couple other tools in Lightroom, uh, namely the color range and the luminance range that can be used to select various areas of your photograph based on color or brightness. Now, I'm not gonna get into those two, don't have time for all of that. We're gonna deal with the, uh, the other tools. About a year ago, the Adobe engineers introduced uh, a set of tools and that's when they created this panel called the masking panel. And to add to the brush and the radial gradient and the linear gradient, they came up with some tools that work on the basis of artificial intelligence. Tools that are smart, tools that are able to recognize things like people or what appears to be the main subject, okay? And they can do so with, with pretty good precision. I'll show you that they're not always totally accurate. So here are the list of tools that are in the masking panel of Lightroom Classic. And that's, this is what we're going to look at. Select subject, which is AI-based, okay? Select sky. So you go to any picture, you just hit that button and it analyzes the scene and based on you know, millions of pictures that it, it has seen before. And if the program can find what looks to be a subject, it gives it a, a tint. So you, you, it selects it. And then you can make the changes with your slider to make it brighter, darker, change the white balance, you know, that, those sorts of things. But the key is using the artificial intelligence to select it and to have it blend in so that it looks natural and you don't get that edging around it or fringing. Uh, another one is select the background. So it actually looks at the image and tries to determine what the subject is and what the background is and then selects the background for you. Select people. Oh, this is amazing. Uh, when I was doing uh, weddings and portraits, uh, of course, if you do a portrait, then you, you'd have to retouch it. So in Photoshop, I would, with a brush, mask the, the teeth and then adjust the teeth. Mask the eyes, adjust the eyes. Mask the skin, adjust the skin, you know, skin softening, all those sorts of things. And I had layer upon layer in Photoshop to do each one of these things individually. Woo, have things changed. Now in Lightroom, it auto, the program automatically looks for people, recognizes people, shows you that they have been selected. And if you want to get into retouching, it gives you the option of selecting just the skin. You can smooth the skin, just the eyes so you can brighten them, just the teeth so you can whiten them, just the lips so you can make them a little redder. Uh, it has opened up what's taken over for a dedicated software program called Portrait, you know, and, and stuff you can do by hand uh, that was very time consuming in Photoshop. It does it now through the use of artificial intelligence. And then the other one is objects. So if you have some object that's not necessarily the subject and it's not necessarily the background, but you want to do something with it, you can use a brush to generally define it. And I'll show you how that, that's accomplished. So let's say you had a soda bottle in a scene and you, you, know, you wanted to at least darken it so that it, it doesn't show up as much, you might use select object. Now, when I'm done, Joe's gonna take over and he's gonna talk about using Photoshop and uh, generative fill. 
that's where you would go if you wanted to use artificial intelligence to completely eliminate that soda bottle altogether and fill the background in with what looks to be a very natural background that blends right in with what's already there. Okay, and then the other tools that are not AI based, but they've been there for, for the, since the beginning, the brush, the linear gradient, the radio gradient, gradient, more recently, as I said, the color range and the luminance range. Now, when you go into Lightroom Classic masking panel, you'll also see the depth range, but it probably will be grayed out that you can't use it. Well, they're planning ahead, okay? Because the, the depth range information is captured by some cameras, most notably by the iPhone and other phone cameras. And there'll be a time then when in Lightroom Classic, you can use that information to your advantage. Okay, so let's move on. Let's look at some examples. Uh, this is a statue uh, in the Louvre in Paris. And uh, I'm just gonna show you a comparison here on uh, some of these images with some of the, the processing that I've done. And then I'll take you into Lightroom Classic and, and illustrate that with a few uh, of these images. So on the left, we have uh, the, the statue. And on the right, what I would consider to be the standard processing that we call the global adjustments. Okay. Now the next slide shows you those global adjustments. And on the right, you can see the statue with the masking that I used on it. I used select subject. And I'll show you this in just a couple of minutes. But the program, Lightroom Classic, selected the subject. And then I made a few changes with the slider that I thought would help make it more prominent and, and bring it out. Specifically, I brightened it a little bit. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the front of the statue is a little brown. It's a little, it's tinted a little bit. Now that's just my artistic uh, approach to this, but I thought if I changed the color a little bit, that would create some color contrast between the statue and the background and make it more discernible. It would stand out a little bit more. Plus the fact that Mike Donovan once told me that warm tones like a brown look closer to you than the cool tones like blue and gray. So that will have the psychological effect of bringing the statue closer, appear, appearing to be closer to the viewer and make it stand out a little bit more. Okay, yeah. And then just as a final comparison, on the left is the original unpressed, unprocessed raw image compared to my final image, the one that I, I posted on my website. And you can see the difference. And you, said, you might say, well, I, I'd be happy with the, the one on the left. I'm not gonna go to all that work. And my response is, well, if you want the image to be the best it can, and if you want to add a, a little bit extra zap to it, I'd say take a little bit extra time and, and do the processing in, in Lightroom Classic. First, do the globalized adjustments, you know, the overall, and then take the next step with the masking panel and do some of these little tweaks that really make it stand out. Now, the one on the left is the original raw file. And, and I have to add that this processing, um, it helps to shoot raw to do this processing because the raw files, of course, give you more latitude you know, in the processing. You're able to make uh, more significant changes without introducing artifacts. Uh, for instance, if, if I were shooting JPEG and I made some of these changes, especially in the sky, you might be able to see them uh, most notably in the form of banding you see these lines running through the sky that, that doesn't look very good. Okay, so again, the same procedure. The one on the left is unprocessed. The one on the right is the standard global adjustments that are made. Go to the next slide. Standard global adjustments on the left and on the right, some changes that I made using the masking panel. And I'm gonna demonstrate this, but just to tell you ahead of time, what I did was I had Lightroom Classic select the sky and then I changed the brightness level and the tone of that a little bit. And then, and this is slick, really slick. You can hit a command that duplicates that selection 
and inverts it. So what it does with the sky selected, you hit that command and it, the next selection is everything but the sky. So now I could make changes to the boat and the tree and, and the bridge and the Eiffel Tower and, and the statues very easily with a, with a slider. And then what I've done essentially is darken the sky and brighten the foreground okay, to, to get the exposure more the way I want it. And then finally, to compare the, the, the before and after. One on the left is the original unprocessed file. The one on the right is my final version. OK, next one. This is called Nike. It's uh, also in the Louvre, and it's uh, the winged statue there. Uh, there are so many people, so many people, that I can't tell you how many times I took images into Photoshop and used generative fill to get rid of people. Now, in this case, I was able to find a higher vantage point so I could crop them out. <laughs> so I was able to get up on a couple of steps somewhere and uh, uh, get above the crowd. So even though you could see it in the original shot, I could crop that out, which you see on, on the one on the right. And the reason I got, well, I got back further and shot wider is because I like to straighten the images. If, if you're looking up at something and you're taking a picture of it at angled when you're looking up, there's a keystoning effect that makes it look like it's leaning backwards and maybe falling over. And in Lightroom Classic, it's fairly easy to change that and you bring that, that up so in the transform panel so that it doesn't look like it's leaning over backwards. But what typically happens is if you, if you shoot tight, when you do that, it crops off the top of the statue. So what you want to do is shoot loose so you can use that transform tool, straighten the statue, and then I cropped it to get the image on the right. Next slide. The, the one on the left is the standard processing that's cropped. And on the one on the right, I selected the background and then darkened it just to increase the contrast between the statue and the background. Now. You might raise the point, well, I don't like that look. Well, I'm not sure I do either. I did this for illustrative purposes. It, it's The point is not whether you like the specific action that I've taken or not, but to appreciate the fact that you can do it in Lightroom Classic and you can do it easily and quickly. So let's say instead of making the background black, I could have made it a different color, maybe a little bluish. I could have darkened it. I could have lightened it. The point is, once it's selected, you could use any of those sliders in Lightroom to change it the way you want. And then again, the before and, and, and the final image. Okay, a couple more. And, and what I'm doing here is I'm going through each one of those tools that I listed earlier that are available. This one, I'm down to the people tool. So we're on the Seine River in Paris, and a dinner cruise with my wife's with me, and this is my brother and uh, his wife, Karen. So you can see in the original, eh, it's not too impressive, but it's a raw file, and I, I knew I could work with it. So on the right, I did the standard processing, the global adjustments, which included cropping and like decreasing the highlights and bringing up the shadows. But notice, especially my brother's face, I don't know if Chip's on, on uh, with us tonight or not. Don't think so. But uh, uh, dark. He just, he just, it looks flat. Okay. So with Lightroom processing on the right, I select, use the tool select people and then just brightened. And it's select he and Karen. And then I could just brighten them up a little bit so they stand out a little bit more. Now, granted, I may have overdone a little bit on some of these, what they call over-processing. Uh, I wanted you to be able to, I wanted you to be able to see the effect. So if I went back and redid these to, to make them look as what I think is as good as they possibly could, I might back off a little bit on the processing. But I wanted you to be able to see that, yes, that brightened, you know, not only their faces, but their whole bodies to make them stand out and, and darken the background a bit. So then you end up with the original unprocessed raw file on the left, the final processed image on the right. Okay, next tool. 
would be select object. Now, in this picture, what I wanted to do was highlight the scene as seen through on the girl's, on the woman's phone. So I wanted to brighten the screen of her phone. So you say, well, which tool do you select? Do you pick to, that, to select what you want? Well, if I would have picked select subject, it most invariably would have picked her. Okay. She's the main subject, look, appears to be the main subject, but not in my mind. See, she's secondary in my mind. The main subject is the screen of her phone. So I use the tool select object and you just take a brush and you brush it around over the screen of the phone. And you don't have to stay within the lines. You don't have to be careful. You just roughly define that area and the computer or the, the software program, Lightroom Classic, uses its brain, its artificial intelligence, to know that you want it to select the part within that. So it highlighted the screen. And then on the right, I brightened the screen, increased the contrast a little bit, increased the color a little bit. So it, it brought it out more. So it, it's definitely what you look at. Okay, when you look at, at the scene, at the picture. Before, after. Okay, and uh, as soon as I get through all these pictures, I'll be glad to entertain questions before I get into uh, to, to Lightroom and, and show you how to do some of this stuff in Lightroom. Uh, this is a picture uh, of a lighthouse boat on the Seine River. And uh, it just looked kind of flat to me. So on the left, unprocessed. On the right is with the basic global adjustments. Uh, on the left with the standard processing, so you compare it, can compare it with what I did with the masking panel. This, which tool you select is up to you. you sometimes you can use you know, one tool or another and you'll get the same selection. In this case, I chose to use just the brush because I wasn't sure if I use the subject, is it gonna find that as the subject? Is it gonna pick part of the wall? You know, wh what is it gonna pick? So I thought, well, I'll at least define it. So I simply used a brush in the old fashioned manner and just brushed over the boat to, to and then used the slider to, to brighten it and give it a little more contrast. Okay. And again, comparison then, the original raw file on the left, the final edition on the right. Uh, again, using the brush, and this is, uh, I think this was in Geneva, Switzerland, but you can see how flat the original raw file is, and trust me, those panels in the back were, were very colorful tiles. They were beautiful, but you can't tell that from the raw file, it lacks that sort of, that contrast. And even when you do the standard processing in Lightroom Classic, it still doesn't bring out the color and the definition in those panels. But look what happens on the right. When you take a brush and select those areas, okay, and then bring up the saturation of the color, bring up the brightness, bring up the, the contrast a bit, uh, it brings those panels out and, and they're much more attractive you know, than they would be otherwise. So if I would have used the global adjustment, it just would have affected the whole image and you brighten or darken the whole image. That's not what you want. You want to selectively brighten certain areas and darken certain areas and add color to certain areas, reduce color in other areas. The things you want to stand out, okay, and the, this is, the research has been done. If you want something to stand out and something to be noticed by your viewer, you generally make it brighter, more colorful, sharper, more contrast. So if you want something to stand out, give it those criteria. If you want something to recede and, and not be noticed as much, do just the opposite. Make the background darker, blurrier, less colorful. And these tools in Lightroom Classic allow you to do both of those steps very easily and very quickly. So typically my workflow is this. I'll take the unpressed raw file and I'll do my global adjustments, but I darken the whole picture. Then I select, I use the tools to select the areas that I want to bring out and I brighten them, make them more colorful, make them sharper. 
And then I'll typically use that step where you can duplicate the selection and invert it. That gives me everything else. And then I do just the opposite. I darken, reduce the sharpness, reduce the color saturation a little bit, okay? And sometimes reduce the, or change the U a little bit as I did with the statue, that first picture. I made the Sphinx a little warmer to bring it forward and the background a little cooler to make it recede. Okay, so bringing out the detail. And here we go then, uh, unprocessed raw file on the left, the final version on the right. Uh, this is a painting on the ceiling in the Louvre. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that the right-hand side is much brighter than the left-hand side. So this is a case where I can use a masking tool not so much for creative effect as it is to correct. I can use it to balance the exposure a little bit. I, I don't want that difference in exposure between the two sides of the image. So first I did my standard processing to just to make the whole thing look a little bit better. And then used a linear gradient from the right to the middle of, to the right, from the right edge to the middle of the painting so that the, and, and then lowered the exposure a bit until the left side and the right side don't vary by much in terms of, of its brightness. So using one of the tools in a corrective fashion more than a creative one. This one, however, is, is the radial, uh, whoops. Yeah, that was the linear. This is the radial uh, brush, radial gradient. And of course, there's the unprocessed raw file. And then I did the standard processing there on the right. And then on the left, notice how the middle part of the painting stands out more than it does on the version on the left. That's because I took a radial gradient by hand and just defined the center part, the oval where the painting is in the middle, and then brightened it, increased the color a little bit and the saturation to make it stand out using the radial gradient, okay, before, original, and, and the final. Okay, this is, a, is pretty dramatic. Uh, this is a beautiful bridge over the Seine in Paris, and look how flat the unprocessed raw file is. And even when I did the standard processing with the global adjustments, eh, it lacks pizzazz, okay? So, once I got in with the processing tools, the masking tools, look at the change I was able to make with, with the bridge in the sky. So one of the first things I did was select the sky, changed it a little bit. Then I did that duplicate and invert step and brightened the foreground, brightened everything except the sky. And then the one last step, if you look closely at the lights, okay, on the bridge, they look like they're lit. Okay, this is a trick I picked up years ago from uh, uh, Serge Romelli, and he's from Paris, coincidentally. Uh, and I know Joe uses it sometimes, but you take the radial gradient tool and you draw a little radial gradient over each light, each street light, and then use a slider to brighten it. And you can also add some color to it, like orange, to make it look like a, an incandescent light. It's really cool, but adds a lot of pizzazz. Look at the difference then between the original raw file on the left and my final version on the right. Okay, one more to show you, and then uh, we're off to to use light or well, answer questions you might have before we move on to Lightroom. This is a, a was a, a pretty looking cafe on the street in Paris, but you couldn't tell it from the raw file. It looks pretty flat. So I did my basic processing on the right and it brought out some of the color at least and some of the detail, but look how flat the building is. Yeah, look how dark the sides of the building are and the street, it, it just, it lacks something. So you can see that image, the standard processing on the left there, but then on the right, the lower right, I simply took a brush and brushed over like the upper part, like right here. See how much brighter it is here than it is up here? And the building down here and, and the wall here, they're brighter than, than in this image. And uh, some other, maybe, no, that's, 
I just brushed over those areas and didn't have to be very didn't have to be precise at all. Just a big soft brush and went whoop whoop whoop. That's what surge does. Whoop whoop, and, and then just uses the slider to brighten them up a little bit, and it just adds some contrast to that building and and brings out the detail that didn't you didn't see before. Okay, uh, there says so before, after. Yeah, what a dramatic difference with the color, the definition, yeah, you know, the detail. Okay, and if you want to really, you know, add some uh, interesting and interesting look to to a photo like this, you take it into a program called Snap Art. Okay, I've been using this program for many many years, and, and I love it. But this is the watercolor uh, 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 painting effect, and I added it to this picture, which I think just just did a great job. Uh, makes it look something special. So when I post it on Facebook or show it to people, you know, it, it, they look at it longer and find it more interesting because, well, because it's colorful, because it's interesting, but it has a different look to it. Uh, it's not as realistic looking as the images you get, uh, you know, the image that I had before I applied the watercolor effect. So uh, here's the other biggie, biggie, biggie helpful feature in Lightroom Classic. Now, if you use Lightroom Classic, you know about syncing. If you have a number of similar images, you do the processing on one, and then you tell Lightroom Classic to make those changes to all of the other images that you have selected. Saves you a lot of time. Here's the one-upper. With artificial intelligence, with these masking tools, when you sync, including the masking tool, Lightroom Classic looks at each individual photo and makes changes according to the composition of that individual photo. For instance, if there are people in the different photos, but they're different people in their different positions, and you said in the first image you had select people and then you brightened the, the people to, to make them stand out a little bit more, in the next image, the artificial intelligence part of the program will look for any people in the picture. It'll select the people, even if they're different people in different positions, and it'll brighten them. Then it'll go to the next image and do the same thing. It'll make all the, the global adjustments that you indicated in the first picture, and then it'll, it'll intelligently look at that, that individual image, find the people, and brighten them, even if they're different people in different positions. That saves you a heck of a lot of time. Can you imagine going into each picture and then having to go through all the same steps over and over again? You don't have to. You just sync the changes. Woo! And here's how you do it. This uh, uh, dialog box comes up when you hit sync and Lightroom Classic gives you the option and says, hey, Dennis, which one of these changes do you want? Do you want to copy to the other photos? And if you want all of them, that's fine. But often because there's a different composition, you might want to might want not want to crop. You don't want Lightroom to crop every picture the same way. You want to do that yourself. But as far as the other changes, yeah, if they're similar, you know, you can tweak them later. But the big one is I have circled in red is the masking. If you want Lightroom to use its artificial intelligence to change each one of those pictures, yeah, intelligently, you just check masking, go get a cup of coffee, and come back in a few minutes doesn't take long either. All right, all right. So I'm gonna show you how to make some of these changes. Uh, when I send this uh, with the email out tomorrow, I'll, I'll send this whole, P, uh, whole PowerPoint presentation as a PDF. And here are some excellent uh, videos that uh, go over what, what I'm going to show you. They're gonna do the same thing I'm gonna do, uh, but, but, but it's, sometimes it's helpful to see a different person do it, like Julianne Cost. She's the guru for Adobe, and, and I love watching her videos. Anthony Morganti, Joe knows about Anthony. We both uh, love the videos that he does. Matty Kay, Matt Kluskowski, uh, he's been doing this kind of stuff with Lightroom for a long time. I watched all of those videos. They're all excellent. Uh, they would give you a very good uh, uh, review of what I'm talking about. If you need to take a step back and, and go over more of the global adjustments, then I would say search YouTube for any one of these presenters and just indicate, you know, using light develop module of Lightroom. 
you know, to edit your photos. Okay. All right. Uh, with the understanding that I'm going to move into Lightroom and show you how to do this on a few photos, uh, I'll answer you know, questions you know, directly then. But do you have any questions for me before I do that? So go hey, ahead. Dennis? Yes. Hey, Dennis, uh, quick question. Um, and I've done a lot of masking, so I'm familiar with uh, those procedures. The one Very thing good. I found, and you can, you can defer to the next section if it makes more sense, but when I mask, um, and I, regardless of what it is, whether it's, uh, you know, select subject or do an object or whatever, I mm -hmm. get the same default um, adjustments. Be, you know, I, I expect it to kind of start it with a baseline of no changes. I go make the changes, but I've already got it, you know, uh, things already adjusted. You know, the the clarity is dropped and uh, I don't know, well, there's four or five things that are already adjusted. So it didn't sound like the same thing as sync, but I must have something in there. So when a new mask is created, it by default already starts with some adjustments. Well, let me see. Uh, there are a couple of things that could be going on. Do you use an import preset? No. Okay. Uh, People who use an import preset, whenever your original pictures are imported into Lightroom, light, you've told Lightroom to automatically apply certain changes to the image. Mm -hmm. okay. So so that would mean some of your images are already changed, are already edited to some degree. Uh, they're not always zeroed. Uh, right. The other thing would be there is the button down in Lightroom in the develop module uh, you can have it, it can be set to auto and it can make changes from one picture oh. to another that you don't want. So if you see, can you see my screen now with the yep. Sphinx? This yes. previous button, if it says auto, you want to change that. You want to click okay. on it so, it's, so it doesn't say okay. auto. But, okay. but other I'll, than I'll, that, I'll that, yeah, when you sync your images and you use that dialog box I was showing you, you can specify which changes you want Lightroom to make. So like if you don't want it to crop the image like you did the first one, the first one was tilted this way, but the second one's tilted this way. So yeah. you don't check crop. So it'll just leave that second image uncropped and right. we'll leave all, all of the other images uncropped. And then you go in and adjust them individually. Now, as okay. far as applying a mask, once you do the mask, if you start from scratch in a mask, it won't have it. It'll select the, the subject first and there'll be no slider changes at all. Okay, that, that's that's where I that's not the experience I've had. So I must have something goofy going on because when I do a new mask, I could only import import only a single photo, you know, in, to simplify it. And then if I do a, a mask, all of a sudden the mask automatically populates with some changes made uh, to it, you know, from the get go, even okay. before I touch the sliders. But okay, if you use the sync process and you have masking selected then it will apply the same mask and the same changes that you made with that to that mask in the first photo. Okay. If you're um, yeah, I'll, I'll check that auto setting. That might be it, but uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's, let's just uh, show you specifically how this is done a little bit. I won't go through all of the images that I have, but when you, uh, well, let me close that. Here's my basic image, and this is what you would see in, in uh, the Lightroom develop module. And let's assume you've done your basic changes, your global adjustments. And, and trust me, if you don't know how to do the global adjustments, here's a great place to start. Boom, auto. I would not have said this a number of years ago, but they've improved the auto button. So if you're not sure what to do with the sliders, hit auto and, and see what Lightroom does with it. And if you don't like it, you, know, you can make the changes by moving the sliders. But as I told you, my approach is typically to darken the whole image. So I kind of like the way this image looks right now, not as a final product, but as the background. And then I'll use the masking tools to bring out the Sphinx as I showed you in, in the PowerPoint presentation. So let's do that. This is the mask, the icon for the masking panel. So I click on it. Here are my options. And the very first one is select subject. And that's why I put them in this order. So let's go select subject. And this is a little slow. See, it says detecting. And I'm using a CR3 files, which are raw files from my Canon R6. So I apologize, but this it is a little slow. Oh, but there it is. It came up. So Lightroom Classic thinks that my subject is the Sphinx and this panel in the back and this guy who's sticking his head out. 
well, I'm going to crop this guy out. That's not going to be a problem. But this is a problem because if I go to brighten the Sphinx now, see the, the, the red overlay just shows you what it has selected, what it thinks is the subject. Well, it didn't get it quite right. So we're going to have to correct that. But if, if I want to now brighten what it has selected, I just come over here to exposure. And as soon as I click on that, oh, look, the overlay went away. And now as I move the slider, look what brightens. Just the part that was selected. That's the whole idea. Okay, Lightroom selects it, and I'd make the changes to it. So I'm going to brighten it up a little bit. And maybe what I do a lot of times is I'll... I'll I'll darken it, I'll lower the blacks and increase the whites to give it a little more contrast. And it's only affecting that selected area now. And I often increase the shadows a little bit and decrease the highlights. But the big thing was with the exposure. And I've increased the exposure by 0.5, that's half a stop. Now, the other thing I did was I brought out, the, the, I changed the color of it a little bit here with the, the, uh, the slider. And I just moved it over to the right a little bit to make it a little brownish, okay, yellowish. See there, it would make it really brown. But I just moved it over just a tint just to help separate it from the background. Okay, now, if I'm happy with that and I don't mind this panel behind the Sphinx being changed too, I'm good to go. Oh, I forgot to crop. I'd have to crop it first. But if I want to get rid of that, Oh, and by the way, if I want to show the overlay again, I want to see what, what area I was making changes to, I just make sure that mask is, I'm on that mask, and I just cl uh, click here to show overlay. Yeah. There it shows it. There it hides it. Okay, so let's show it. And I want to get rid of this part in the back. I want to subtract that from the selection. So here's how you do that. You click on the mask, and you get the options. Do you want to add to your selection or do you want to subtract? Oh, I want to subtract. Oh my, look at this. Oh, it gave me options. Too many options sometimes. So how am I going to tell Lightroom Classic to subtract that? It's not the subject. Well, I don't, it, it, it thought it was the subject, so that won't work. It's not the sky. Well, I could try background because it's, but, but it already thought it was the subject. So I think my safest bet is it's a fairly regular geometric shape. It could be considered an object. So let's try that. I'm going to pick objects, and I get what looks like a brush. I'm going to make it a little smaller. And I'm going to outline this area. I'm going to, I'm going to cover it. And I don't have to stay within the line so much. I just want Lightroom to try to recognize this area. Now, not the Sphinx. Let's see what happens when I let go. Ready, go. Okay, working, 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 working. Okay, and what I hope it does, it just selects that part, that panel, and subtracts it from the selection. Yeah, it does take a little while. It's a little slower on this laptop, too, than it is on my uh, desktop upstairs. Oh, look at that. It did it. It knew where the boundary was, and it only subtracted that area. It didn't subtract anything else. Now, it looks like I have some little red lines down here. Why didn't it take those out, too? Well, I guess I have to subtract those, too. So let's go to subtract. What would be the quickest way? Oh, probably just a brush. So I select brush. I go over here, see the little minus sign on the brush, and I'll just, I could increase, let's make a little larger, so it's a little easier. And I just brush over those and notice the red disappears. Cool. Okay. Now, I have my, my image. I can turn the overlay off, and I already made my changes here. I increased the exposure uh, <laughs> and warmed it up a little bit to help make it stand out from the background. Voila finished image. <laughs> All done pretty quickly. And, and a lot of times in the past when we've made selections, or if you were in Photoshop and you made selections, it didn't do a very good job around the edges and you would get fringing. So when you would increase the exposure, it might bleed over into the background. 
And then you'd see this white fringe around the, the subject, which didn't look good at all. And the engineers have done an amazing job getting these selection tools to, to feather in and just, just select the, the subject or whatever you're after. Again, okay. Dennis, you've got those two little white marks there behind uh, uh, behind this thing. The lights? Yeah. Okay. Right. You want to get rid of those? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm done with my masking, so I can click on the masking icon there to close it. Okay. Now I'm going to crop the, that guy out. So let, let me do that just because he's annoying. Okay. So I crop it out, bring this down a little bit to fill up more of the frame. Bring this. Oh, I'll just bring that. Hey, I got rid of one of them. And I'll bring this up a little bit because I don't need all that. Uh, boom. Now that illustrates a, a very good point. Cropping is a very powerful tool. And I should have done that first because cropping can eliminate some problems that you might want to you know, get rid of later. And you just crop them out. <clears throat> now, with with the I want if I want to get rid of this light, now I still have that to worry about, but if I just want to get rid of the dot there. I could come up to the Band-Aid, which is the healing tool, and try one of these. This is the Content Aware Remove tool. So I could adjust the size of my brush there, and I'll swipe. I'll just click and drag over that a little bit. And it should use Content Aware to fill in, and boom, it's gone. Yeah, All right. so, I've, All right. so I've taken care of that. And that's as much as I would do with this image. Of course, in Lightroom Classic, if you want to compare before and after, you just take your index finger and put it on the backslash, backslash button. There's before, there's after. Before, after. And you say, well, that's not a real big difference. Well, no, no. The idea is not to be, you know, shocking. The idea is to be subtle that it makes a difference if you look at it and you study the image and, and you know, it, it, it does make a difference. Okay. So that is. Yes. Oh, I was going to ask the shadow of the person's head on the base of the statue in the front. I was wondering sure. if that could be removed also, if you had thought about that. No, where do you see it? Oh, oh, oh uh, I see it down here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It can be. Yes. That's a little bit more of a, a complicated issue. And, uh, well, quite frankly, what I would do with that would be take it into Photoshop and use the cloning tool. Okay. That would probably be the easiest way, uh, I would think, to, to get rid of that. Uh, you could try you could try selecting it with the mask. Well, let's, let's try it just since you brought the uh, issue up. Uh, I don't know if it'll work. Uh, let's say it looks like an object. I got this. Let's see this. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to assume well, I'm going to see if Lightroom Classic will recognize it as an object. So, I go to the masking panel. Oops, I just closed it. Open the masking panel and since oh, this is a good point though. S look at the panel that comes up since I already have one mask created, then to create a new one I have to go up here and click on create new mask to get these options. So, I'm going to pick object now I'm gonna go down here, make my little bit smaller. I'm gonna go just around that area and see if it picks that up as an object. Okay, I'm detecting, detecting, detecting. And then the question is, can I brighten it to make it look normal, natural? Working, working, working. Yeah, the, the things you can do in Lightroom now were only possible you know, uh, uh, this only happened like a year ago. So before that, you could only do most of these things in Photoshop. But more and more of the things, ooh, kind of, it kind of got it. So if I want to just subtract a little bit from that, let's say I take the brush and I'm just going to subtract. It went a little too far over here and over here. Now, the question is, when I brighten it, is it going to look right? So I take the exposure. <laughs> well, maybe not the exposure. Maybe just bring up the shadows. See that? <laughs> that's not looking very natural. I might have to 
that would take some playing around. So to get that to blend in there is very difficult. And in Lightroom didn't do a great job on the selection. You can see the white fringing there around the edges. So yeah. as I say, the best, most effective way to deal with that would be with the uh, uh, clone tool in Photoshop. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks for trying. I wanted to see. Sure, you. sure. Now uh, I'm taking more time here. I want to give Joe some time. So let me do one other thing here uh, to show you just another example. Uh, hey, hey Dennis. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I have trouble with invert. You include that? Okay, okay. Let's take this one, which we'll do an invert on. Uh, what kind of problems do you have, Jim? When I select the invert and I go to make an adjustment to the invert, it changes the whole picture. No, that shouldn't happen. Okay. Yeah, as you can see, so, uh, things don't look very good here. So let's select the sky. Okay. Boom. Now, again, it's going to take a you know minute or so. Going to detect the sky. <laughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Uh, and it'll show us the overlay on the sky. Okay, well, there we go. So let's say I wanted to brighten the sky a little bit, make it a little more bluish. It's twilight, twilight zone. No, I mean, twilight hour, blue hour. Okay, so now <laughs> I've selected the sky, and if I want to show the overlay, just click there, that's the overlay. Now I'll go up here to masking, to that mask, make sure I click on that, click on that mask, and come over here to the uh, ellipses, the three little dots, click there and it says duplicate and invert. So I click on that and now the mask has just reversed. The mask is over everything else but the sky. So now that was too dark. So I know I wanna brighten that up. So as I bring up the exposure, there you can see the details coming up. I'm gonna make the darks a little, add the contrast to it by Decreasing the blacks, increasing the whites, bring up the shadows a little bit, decrease the highlights, might increase the, make it a little warmer, let's say, if you want. Uh, might bring up the saturation a little bit to get those collars to come out on the, down here on the, uh, whatever that is, a restaurant or whatever. And if I, boom, show you the overlay on that, it's everything but the sky. So there you go. Duplicate and invert. Uh, Thank you. If I can ask one more very quick question. Sure, What's George. What's the difference between to straight invert and duplicate and invert? Great question, because I was just using a regular invert. So oh, oh, okay. you, you, you read my mind. You're, you're, you're changing the, change, the selection you already made. Like if, if I go to the uh, just uh, the first mask down here, I selected the sky. Okay. Now, if I just invert, I'm changing that mask which I brightened, I brightened the sky. So now all of a sudden I'm brightening the foreground and the sky goes back to the way it was. Okay. You, you've just inverted whatever change you made. So uh -huh. you wanna duplicate the mask first to maintain the first change, the sky. And then that gives you a mask of the foreground which you can then change separately. Okay. Perfect, thank you. That's what I needed. Yeah. Yeah, you screwed Thanks. up your, your mask one when you did that. You just inverted, you changed it from the sky to the foreground. Okay, and then one more before we move on to Joe. And I want to do my, my brother because it's people. Let's see, people, people, people. Yeah, this is, wasn't a very good looking photo. Uh, I may have taken this with my iPhone. You know, I'm not sure. But anyway, okay, let's go. Whoops, let me get rid of that. Okay, I would do my basic processing, which I haven't done. I'm gonna go straight to the uh, masking panel and I'm going, oh, look, people. It's already searching, it's detecting people. I didn't have to do anything. It looks for people automatically, okay? So let's just wait until, until it's done searching and I'm sure it'll find uh, Chip and Karen, but watch, watch what it does. Come on. So I have examples. I was going to go through a whole bunch of other examples and show you using the brush, using the linear, using the gradient. Yeah, uh, it, they all work in a similar way. And as I said previously, the one you pick, okay, depends on the circumstances. The sh if you're looking for people, that's obvious. If it's not a person, but it's definitely stands out as the subject, subject will probably work. If it's an object, but it's not the subject, you know, then object will work. 
If it's the sky, no question, then the sky works. So, but sometimes you can you can pick one that will do the same thing as another. Like if the object you're looking at is also the subject. Anyway, look what it's done. It has given me options. If I want to select all the people in the picture, <laughs> I can do that, but it picks up this guy too, and that, that guy. If I just want to select Karen, see the mask is now over Karen. If I just want to select Chip, okay, person three in the background, person four there in the foreground, person five, person six. In the, oh, wow. Well, I'm not concerned about those people. I just want Chip and Karen. So let's see what I can do. If I can do Karen. Oh, yeah, I want to do Chip and Karen. So I said it detect Karen's features. Now, here's where we get in. You can get into portrait retouching. Look what it does. You select either the entire person or I could just select her facial features to do skin retouching, like skin softening. I could, or body skin, her neck. Eyebrows, oh my, look at this. You can, you can get into technical, you know, if you're doing a formal portrait is where you would use that. But I'm gonna interested in brightening her as an entire person. And I wanna add chip to that. So I hit add chip, add person. And I piss, he's person number two. So I add him and now it's, I, I have to hit continue. It's gonna mask him also. And oh yeah, still detecting him. So now that the overlay should come up over both Chip and Karen, which it does. Okay, so now, oh, do I have to create the mask? Go down to the bottom, yep. I have to tell it to take, now to take another final step, actually create the mask. And now I can make my changes. So now I can brighten them up, okay? And they look a little, like they lack contrast. So again, I'm gonna decrease the blacks, increase the whites, increase the shadows, decrease the highlights to get them not, don't wanna brighten them up too much, just a little bit. And uh, highlights a lot. Yeah, you play, you can play around with this. They're really, oh, there we go. They were lacking contrast. So I really had to, to decrease the blacks a lot to get them to look natural. Now, Look how unnatural the background looks. <laughs> so now I would want to change the background and keep the changes I made to Chip and Karen. So I come up to, let's see, mask one is both of them. Let me just check to see. Yeah, that's both of them. Okay, so now I'm on mask one, which is both Chip and Karen, and I go to duplicate and invert. So now it just shows me everything except Chip and Karen. And now I can play around with the background and, and like get it to darken it or, you know, so it doesn't look quite so ugly. That, it's not a great picture to begin with. And that's over overdone, but uh, that gives you the, the idea of the power of, uh, of the masking tools. Okay, I'm going to stop at this point, entertain <clears throat> questions, and then turn it over to Joe. So uh, any questions for me? Yeah, why did you not take out that pole to the left of those two folks? That is the support for the window of the boat. No, I understand that. It's just and I, I well, what I did in the final image is I cropped it. And it's okay. not as as uh, pervade, not as obvious. So I, I brought it in something like maybe I got rid of it all together. Yeah, pretty pretty much. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. it, it really divides the image. So yeah, if does. I cropped it to something like that then I just have this brace part to deal with and I could go over here to the band-aid right. and I could try this one and see if it eliminates that. I'm not sure it will. Uh, I, and if that doesn't work, I could try the other ones. And if that doesn't work, then I would take it into Photoshop and use generative fill, which definitely will work. See, it's still analyzing, trying to get rid of that. Okay, other questions? Just unmute yourself and fire away. Diane? Yeah. Okay. George, anything else? No, thanks a lot. I'm good to go. Okay. Dennis. Anybody else? Dennis? Yes. Don't you think you want to? I was thinking you'd want to get that pole that's sticking out of the back of his head. Yeah. See, my, my emphasis tonight is to show you the masking tools. And if I wanted a final image, you know, I didn't get into doing the global adjustments and, and I didn't get into fine tuning stuff that, that you would normally want to do on your final image. My emphasis here is just to take time to show you the masking panel tools. 
Yeah, Mike Donovan's wearing off on us. Yeah, I know. Picky, picky, picky. Hey, Dennis, Don Uvick. Yes, Don. Hey, just a suggestion, If and, and you don't need to do it for the ones that you have here, but when I do a lot of masking for a particular image, I do go in and rename them, give them something, because if I have like five or six there, it becomes kind of easier to manage if I say, you know, Fred, and Wilma, if there's two people I have in there that I want to separate them, building, whatever, just something generic so that you have some identification of the types of masks that you've created. And it's more of an impact when you have several of them. You, you know, change the name of the mask. Yeah, I rename them instead of having a, you know, image one re-inverted. You'll see the names it gives you, but yeah. I do that, especially yeah. if I have five or six and some that I've made some fine tune masks. Uh, it's just easier to, to get right to the mask if you decide you want to change it again. That's a good idea. I like that. And if, and if you're in here, then uh, you would, uh, let's see, to, oh, right there it is, rename. So yeah, you just click on, on the three little dots to the side, to the right of the mask, and you could you know rename the mask. So yeah, that's certainly a good idea. And uh, it's a similar recommendation that I would make when you're in Photoshop and you're working with different layers is to rename them so it's clear what their purpose is. Okay, anything else? Okay, Joe said he only needed 10 minutes and it's 8.12, so we're in good shape now. I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna turn it over to Joe. Let's see, skip this time, stop share. Okay, whoops. Okay, all yours, Joe. Okay, thank you, Dennis. And um, we are going to talk about generative fill. And I am going to tell you what it is first. And it'll be a very, there's only two, there's only one page of text here. So um, what is it? It's a, an Adobe product. It uh, comes from other products in their product line, but it's a generative fill is an Adobe product. They didn't buy it from somebody else. What it is used for under 1B is for add, removes, and changes things in your image. It actually changes them. It doesn't, um, that's what it does. It changes them. It's just, right now it's in Photoshop beta and it's free for now. And it is in beta. And I'll show you how you can get that uh, through the Creative Cloud. The key thing on 1D is this process takes place not in your computer, rather on Adobe servers. For instance, all the things that Dennis talked about on AI are done in your computer. If you do not have an internet connection, those functions still work because they're in your computer. This generative fill requires that you are online because all the processing takes place at Adobe on their servers in their computers, not in yours. And the third of uh, the item E, you, on generative fill, you can start from scratch, meaning you can have a blank canvas and you can create a whole new image, much like some of the things that you see on futuristic stuff, like on this program here, Mid Journey does. Um, so you can actually create a whole new image. You don't have to take one of your current images. So some notes, where is, if I make a change, and I replace somebody and they replace a wall behind them, uh, where does this stuff come from? And that comes from Adobe stock. They have 200 uh, million images in Adobe and they're relying on th those images to generate the stuff that you wanna replace. And I'll show you that in a minute. Is it legitimate to use this? Can you take and use uh, generative fill and, and use it in an image and then sell it? Then the answer to the question is yes, because Adobe has licensed it, all the images from their owners and they're not done with that process yet. And that's not completely defined yet within Adobe as to how much commercial use you can use for generative fill. That's, I think from whatever I'm reading, that's still in um, uh, flux. When will it be mainstream as opposed to a beta, which it is now? I have no clue. 
And they're, that's why they're offering it for free now so that people will try it and get a good handle on it. And, and Adobe will be watching how many times that people go back and forth and back and forth trying to make something work. Under the some notes, under, under item number 2D, currently it's limited to 1024 resolution. So when they generate an image or a portion of an image, it's in the, in the resolution of 1024. And they're doing that now for speed purposes. Uh, the word is that when they come up with the final product, you'll be able to uh, use higher resolution. If doing this, is this cheating? Well, that's up for discussion. What about the pricing? According to the sources that I have had, yes, you will need to pay for it. It will be a pay service. So Adobe is testing the pricing at various places with different people. And what they're gonna do from the word I hear on the street is that they're going to say for your, your basic Adobe subscription, you're gonna have so many credits. And in those credits, you will be able to do so many images. And if you do those so many images within your credits, it's free. And if you go beyond that, then you're gonna have to pay. And an example of that is Mid Journey, and that's on the, the next page here. This is not Adobe. There is no implication that this is what Adobe is gonna do, but this is the concept behind it. For instance, you'll uh, have a prescription, you'll have a subscription cost, and that may be what it is now, $10, I don't know. And it's going to have, because all this processing takes place on Adobe servers and not in your computer, you're going to pay for CPU hours. How many hours of their CPU that you're using to generate your images? This is very intensive on the processors. And so they're going to have a limit and based upon pricing tiers. This is this is mid-journey. This is not Adobe, but this is the concept that they probably are going to do. And they have a fast CPU, mid-journey does, and they have a relaxed one. I'm not going to get into that, uh, but that's what they do. And then you can buy extra hours and interesting extra hours rather than extra images because it's gone beyond an image now and they're charging you by the hour of their computers that you're using, and Adobe will basically have the same general concept. However, that's relayed to us, and I don't know, but that's what it is. And that's this is the concept behind the AI plans because it is processor-based at the uh, server place. In this particular one, it is Adobe, okay? So, I'm going to um, take the first image here and show you what AI can do. So I'm in light in, uh, uh, can you see my uh, Norbert there on the screen? Yeah, yes. Okay, good. I'm gonna go to the develop module and I am going to right click on this and I'm gonna say uh, edit it in Adobe Photoshop beta. And I will show you later on how you can get to that beta if you don't have it. So I'm going to click that, and if I bring up Adobe, which I have on the screen, what I want to do, now we really like Norbert, he's a great member, but just for this demonstration, we want to get rid of him. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is take the lasso tool, and I am going to lasso Norbert, but I want to keep a little bit of space around him so that when the Adobe server looks at this, it knows where Norbert is in relationship to the background. So I did that. I have him highlighted. I'm going to do generative fill. And I don't want to say any, I'll, later on we'll go through that. I'm going to say generate. So what it's doing is transferring that image up to Adobe Server right now. I'm online and it's analyzing it and it's going to come back to us with some options for replacing. And I think you left some of his arm in, Joe. 
I, I did right on the edge there. Yeah. Yeah, right on Qu the edge. Quite a bit of it, actually. Okay. So it came back, and I didn't do that right because exactly what you said. So I am going to um, um, control Z. I am going to come back and I am going to shoot. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll just do this guy and we'll get to the same place. See that image that it brought up because right there I did, I, I did it again. Um, and let me uh, command Z, get rid of that and I'm using my laptop here, so I'm not really, David, you've obviously have used this because you knew what that was gonna happen because <laughs> I did that. I'm just anticipating you, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm gonna- Joe, Could you have used uh, select subject or something like that? To I get could it? have done that, but you want to go beyond the subject a little bit. That's really key to this whole process. You have to say, I want to take the I want to take the subject out, but I want to have the context of where he is in the image. And hopefully, since I didn't do the bottom left of his jacket, that that's not going to make a mess. And if it does, I'll show you the there. So what it did is it took out uh, Norbert. Well, in this particular case, the other guy. But look what it did. It look this was out of focus, right? So it created this and it created it on that version. They gave me another version and they gave me another version. If I wanted to, I could generate another three. I could generate by hitting this button here. I could generate another three and another six and another nine. I picked the one that I liked the most. But the key thing is all of this was hidden this was hidden and it created that from scratch. This was, this was uh, right here, Norbert, and there was nothing behind it. It had to manufacture that and it manufactured that because I didn't put the, um, the uh, selection tool right on Norbert. So that's, this is one of the primary functions right here of the using the uh, generative fill is this function here. This is one, it's one, this is where it really does a super good job. And um, so that's, that's it. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna do file and save, where is it here? Close and I'm gonna save it. And it's, it's now saving it down here in the progress bar. This is on my, this is on my computer now because I've already had the image up to Adobe servers. They came back and gave me this and it's saved it now to my uh, computer and it'll be back into Lightroom as soon as the save is done. And if I bring it up, it'll show me that when it replaces it. Still not done saving. There we go. So it took it out of there. That's its main function. Now, you could argue, and you and you should, is that correct or not? I don't know that. Okay. That's why they you can generate three and then another three and another three. But the key thing is it maintained the same out of focus. You'd see that. Norbert was was very, very sharp in there but it didn't it didn't want to change him based upon him but what the background was that's why you go a little bit around him and this is the the crux of generative fill this is basically what it does give you another example and then i'll show you i'm going to do just a couple of them and then i'll go quickly so you can see the befores and afters and this is another one here uh, let me let me pick a different one here. Uh, this is this is this is something I think we all run into in terms of your um, uh, you need more canvas size. 
So I'm going to take this and I'm going to edit it into Photoshop and I'm going to edit it. What it was is on the uh, hot air balloon and I saw that and I got over to the balloon too far and the balloon guy wouldn't turn around, which I didn't even ask him because I know he probably would shoot me. So I am going to now increase my canvas here like that. And this version of the generative fill does not have an automatic function that the newest one has, the beta has, and that is it has a button that will automatically fill this, but I have to do it manually on this particular one. So I'm going to do this, and you notice how I'm going a little bit beyond that spot because I want to bring in some of the dirt. I do that, and I generate, oh, I got to do it twice. I generate it, and it's sending it up to Adobe server. I'm doing this in two parts. I'm going to do the first part is I'm going to, to expand the canvas. And I want you to see how good of a job that does. And it's almost done. Almost done. Almost done. And this is this is the real world here. It's a, this is on my fast computer as well as this laptop. It takes about the same length of time. And it's because there's probably a lot of people hitting Adobe servers right now doing various and sundry things. So it's going to come back. Here it comes. And what it did was it's giving me three options. If you come up here on the right, this is what's shown now. I could pick this one if I think it's better, or I could pick that one if I think it's better. And I think this one is probably the best myself. And that's what it did. Now, this is a very high resolution picture, but this is 1024. This is one of the limits that I mentioned originally. And they're doing that, I think, because they want to speed the whole process up rather than making it really, really slow. Okay. So that's what that did, it expanded the canvas. And you can see, I think it did a remarkable job of that. And now if I wanted to come over here and get rid of this, uh oh, where is it? Oh, right there it is. Oh, I want to do this. Hmm. You know, if you if you zoomed in, can you see a difference in the res because of the yes. resolution difference? Yes, you can. You can do that. I'll, I'll do that when we're done here so you can see that. Now this is not gonna be perfect, okay? Because I'm trying to do this sort of quickly. This is gonna come out looking pretty crappy, but I, I, shouldn't have, um, I shouldn't have done that, okay? And so this, Joe. Yeah. When you're sending that up to the, to the cloud, are they kicking, uh, are they looking through their millions of photographs to find Something yes. that compares? Is that what they're yeah, doing? Exactly. They're going wow. through the 200 million. Now, they don't go through 200 million, as you can imagine, but there's indexes in there and characteristics, and that's what they're doing to pull that out to be able to get rid of something like that. And this will be the last one that I actually show you live on. Um, oh, I did the wrong one. Okay, I'm sorry. I So I'm not going to show you uh, any more of these. I'm going to show you before and afters, okay? So let me do a file close. I screwed that up. I'm going to say don't save. So let me go back to here. I'll show you the ones that I've already done. So we'll just go here. And we're going to go to G under the library module. And on that one here, this is the original. And these are the versions that I did. Okay. And Dennis, your question is, can you see a difference? And yes, you can. Over here, you see the details and over here, they're muddy, aren't they? Can you see that? Yeah, Maybe not. So. That's it's muddy here and over here, it's sharp. And that's yeah. because this is 1024 resolution and this is 5800 or something like that. Yeah, probably more obvious on your screen than mine. Yeah, probably, yeah. Okay, let's take this one here. Um, expanded the canvas, and then I said add a reflection, and it put that reflection in. Let's take another one uh, right here. This was a, um, I don't have anything in here, 
and I wanted that to be uh, uh, the generative fill to fill that in, and it did that. And look what it did. It actually put a dashboard in there. It figured that out. <laughs> Unbelievable. That Took is. out this dog, talk, talk the dog, okay? Here I have this guy, and I said, please replace it with a different woman, and they did. Here is um, a, a, a photograph I took down in um, the Pine Barrens, and uh, when I took the photo, I knew I wasn't I was going to change it, and I used the tools that Dennis talked about, and I created that image, but it didn't have a person in, so I added a hiker right there. I added that hiker in there. Okay. Um, let me see. This is one. This was down in um, uh, Messiah. I took the shot and I did the same thing that Dennis did. His his concepts he just showed you, but I added a person. And you can add, you know, uh, if I don't say hiker walking away from me, they'll have a hiker coming towards me. Okay. Here's another one. This is an interesting one. Is this guy I want to get out? These guys are sharp and he is blurry. So when I did it, it replaced him, but it didn't keep it sharp. It matched the background. This is the reason why you have to have go a little bit beyond the boundaries. And here I said, I want you to keep the fingers in. And I pushed my cursors around his fingers. So the fingers were there and this one there were not. And let me show you some others here. And um, I'll just take this one here. This one, uh, that's my wife in the background and we didn't want that. Um, so that I used generative fill and I took her out. And there was like three different options for that. This was one of them and then I cropped it. But look what it did. It went and on this one here, it didn't know what's behind her, no clue. But since I said, this little bit of stuff here, it filled that in and created a window. It actually created the window. That to me is unbelievable. Yeah, to do that without generative fill with like the clone tool. Oh my would god! Be like you know, almost impossible. And, oh, it would be. It would. You, there would be enough time it in the day. Wouldn't look good either. No. So this is down at uh, Middle Creek and all these ducks. And I wanted to highlight these trees. I just thought they were gorgeous, but I didn't want the ducks in there. So I did multiple versions of generative fill, taking out the ducks and putting in a reflection in the water. That was the words that I use, reflection in the water. And I had various versions of that and that. This is another one here. This was, um, we were, re and there was a, uh, a dog in front of my wife and we had these chains. Now I wanted to get rid of the dog, but what's it gonna do with her foot? And what it did is it created her leg, but it also kept the light over here and the shadow over here and it kept the same shoe, the, it put a shoe up a shoe on her. And it also said, made it real sharp because when I highlighted this, I went around with that little selection tool and it says, oh, that is sharp where she is. Okay, that's what he wants. That's what I want to do. That's what it said. And that's what it did. And this is generative fill in a nutshell. And let me go to you, for those that you do not have it. Oh, this is mid-journey, the one that I'm giving the pricing for. Can you see this with all the stuff yeah. on the screen? Yeah. Okay. This is what they're doing with mid-journey. They're actually creating images. And you can imagine if you were going to create that kind of an image, how much bandwidth it would take to put mushrooms in up here and then a big mushroom here. And, and that's exactly what they're doing and they're using verbal. It's a text to image kind of a thing. And you would say the text you want, and then it would be created. And this is yeah. uh, mid no camera involved at all. No camera. Well, there is on some of them. They, 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 there are a couple normal people. 
I'm I'm sorry, excuse me, not normal people, but like here. Most of the ones in, in mid-journey, though, don't involve a camera image, not a photograph. Right. They're completely text-generated. Right, exactly. And you, But you could also use one of your, your images, if I understand, to, as a starting point. But I don't know exactly how that works, and that may be that may be false. But let me go to um, Safari. Oh, I want to go. Where is uh, where is the top of my thing here? Oh, I got that out of the way. There we go. Let's go to um, the Creative Cloud right here. Can you guys see my Creative Cloud interface? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Normally, you're like into here. In the Creative Cloud, if you want to get the beta version, you do your apps. You'll notice how your app isn't in here. You have to go down to where it says beta apps, and then you can see where you can install the beta app. I'm going to give you a caution. These are the versions of the beta. And the, the latest one is 25. And the one that I have is 24.7. There's a bug in this one that's causing a lot of grief, and it causes grief on my MacBook, which is what I'm using now, and on my window machine, which is my real computer. It, cre it creates the same issue. So I would recommend that you use 24.7 because it does just basically everything except one feature, and, um, and that is it. And that's how you get the beta version. And uh, you can um, take out your old one, or you can have both of them resident in your machine at the same time, the beta version or the normal version. And, um, or the, this one here, the, um, right here, the, your normal Photoshop. Actually, I have it taken out of my computer, but it would have those three lists. It would have Lightroom, Camera Raw, and your Photoshop, which is the normal release one. And then you would also see the beta version of it if you want to use it. And there is no charge for that now. And I strongly suggest that you watch a couple of videos, four or five of them, and anywhere from three to 10 minutes. And by doing that, you'll have a real good handle on how to use it. I would strongly suggest you do not put the beta in and then start working with it because you won't know the little tricks that you need to do. And if you do that, you'll be um, you'll be home. And that is it. Joe, are there other differences between the uh, current version of uh, Photoshop and the beta version? I, I can't see them. I don't know what they are. So, I mean, I just that's why I took out the 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 release version and just use the beta because I can't see the difference. Okay, I, to me they look identical except they for are. the addition of generative fill. I, and I think that that's 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 true. I think it, they're very very they're the same. So I have I, used generative fill on hundreds of the pictures that I brought back from Europe. I mean, like Joe did to take out people mostly. Amazing, amazing. I did three hundred and thirty images for a wedding reception, and Jim, you do a lot of events, and just taken out people that don't belong they're just making your life miserable because you're trying to isolate your subject and you got these people in the back <laughs> man you just zap some right up it works yeah. great. yeah i did a golf tournament saturday i've got plenty of work ahead of me i may try it out yeah any questions okay that's it very good thanks joe Thank okay, you, guys, one more chance. Anybody have any questions or comments uh, before we close for the evening? I'd like to say thank you to both of you. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Really, yeah, yeah, really remark remarkable. Yeah, great. All right. well, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Okay, okay, as usual, tomorrow I'll send out the follow-up email. There'll be a link to the video, and I'll send a copy of my PowerPoint presentation. Joe, do you have anything you want me to send along? Uh, no, I don't think so, Dennis. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, guys, thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Super Bye. session. Bye.